Okay, we're going to move on. One final topic today is balanced mix designs. This issue is right at the fore of today's paving and construction world. And we have just the expert for you. I'd like to introduce Brandon Millar. Brandon's the Director of Technical Services for the California Pavement Association. He's a licensed engineer in, in California. Uh, Mr. Millar relieved, received his Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Cal Poly SLO. In his current Role. He works with asphalt pavement industry and owner agencies throughout California developing asphalt pavement standards, training of uh, technical personnel, and research of new technical, uh, new pavement technologies. For over 25 years, Mr. Millar has provided technical support for processing aggregate designing and testing of asphalt mixtures, constructing asphalt pavements and implementing innovative pavement technologies when not working on all things asphalt. He enjoys uh, exploration of the national parks and, and photography, sharing a meal with family and friends and chasing a little white ball around a pasture. Uh, um, and it is my pleasure to introduce, and you guys have seen him before, Brandon Millar. Sir, it's great to see you this morning. Please proceed. I'm not getting your vo I'm not getting your voice. Hang on. Try, try on voice one more. Place. There you go. Got it. Got it. Go. Perfect. All right. Let's get going. Um, once again, thank you to the Granite Rock team for the invitation to to join all of you today in a in a tech talk. And I know in past tech talks, it's always been great to to hear the latest and greatest going on in the in the world of um, construction materials. So um, this little this session here, we're going to talk about, as you can see, balanced mix design and really looking at how we can get the most out of how can we um, get the most out of um, our materials and really assess them um, from a sustainability aspect. You know, the, the key is, is we want to do a lot more for sustainability, um, but at the same time, we don't want to we don't want to do it and and have a change or a reduction in the performance of our pavement so we'll kind of go through some of the the next generation um, asphalt mix design that that um, you'll be seeing uh, coming our way here in the state of California over the next few years it's great to see all of you all the different agencies being represented including my old ho hometown of Gilroy California way to go um, back then there was only one high school it was Gilroy high school so i was a mustang i know there's two and great rivalry there but anyways uh once again thank you all for 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 joining us today all right we're going to get going here and just to give you a little bit about us um the calapa the the association that i'm representing as the technical director one of the things that we have is our like all good associations is a strategic plan and we try to make a way that everyone can remember what our plan is. Our plan is related to promoting, learning, advocated, advocating, and also providing networking opportunities for, for the entire asphalt pavement community. So if you want more information, you can always join us at um, and, and, and see our, our web presence at calapa.net. So let's look at then and now. I think it's important to put a little perspective in regards to the the pavements that we are um, that we are designing today. The asphalt, not just the the structural design, but really the asphalt mix, the mix that we use every day to build and maintain our pavement structures. So what is then and now? And, and I I do this very specifically, and we'll, we'll get into this. But let's think about the year 1995. Um, what I'm finding is as I as I get older. Um, 1995, I'm sure there's quite a few engineers in our industry who who were born or some were born or or um, or were very young during the 90s. Um, for me, that was my college years and my post college years time. Um, in fact, in 1995 is when I actually was my first year into this industry. But show you how things have changed over the years. Back in 1995, you know, to Toy Story was was released at the box office, and I think we're now on Toy Story 4. But what was crazy about 1995 is that was really the first fully computer-generated film that made it to the big screen. So, you know, that's something. Think about Starbucks, right? 
You know, we're, we're looking at all of their um, all, all of the different ways that they have uh, in, become part of our of our daily lives. And th back then it was just the Frappuccino. Amazon was just a bookstore and that's 1995 is when they sold their first book. But now you buy more than books from them. And you're not even going to a store. You're doing it all online. And speaking of online, eBay was 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 started in 1995. You know, we all look at these great Apple products, these phones. We look at the Samsung phones, the Apple phones, where we have a computer sitting there right in our hands. Back in 1995, Windows was released. And that really changed the game for those of you who have PCs and remember what the original PCs were before a Windows environment when we were doing everything in DOS or very, very uh, uh, rudimentary word processing programs. So anyways, but also in 1995, something else came on, really came to the forefront, and that was super paved. Super paved. That's the 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 mix design procedure that that here in California is is pretty much the standard um, across the state, especially within Caltrans. So, let's look at asphalt concrete in 1995. Nine, primarily here in California, we're designed to the V mix design process. The binders that we are using were pretty much not unmodified binders a different grading system which was eight residue ar 4000s and ar 8000s throughout the state you either used one or the other 8000 was for high traffic 4000 for everything else we did start to uh experiment and start to develop polymer modified binders so so there's your performance based asphalt pba 6a and 6a um with 6a plus and and i know in the bay area 6a plus was used um, quite a bit for night paving and and to get a little bit better performance um, for for some of the routes in in the Bay Area. Uh, dense graded mixes. We had a coarse, a medium, and a fine mix. Three different mix mixes. You were either one inch, half, three quarter inch, half inch, or three eighths inch. All different types of usage, right? Whether it was for high traffic routes or for or for um, uh, residential streets or rural routes, you would use probably closer to finer mixes. Um, and then construction, most of it, most of it was method compaction. In other words, this the standard spec book would tell the contractor use these type this type of equipment and roll it this way, and then that's considered acceptable. Now let's look at asphalt mixes today in 2023. We no longer call them asphalt concrete; we call them HMA, hot mix asphalts. We now use the super pave process to design these mixes. We have a completely different binder grading system. This is a performance grading system where we're looking at a high temperature range that, that we specify for, a low temperature range we specify for, and a mid temperature that we're also looking at as well. We're doing a lot more when it comes to modified binders, whether it's modified with polymers or asphalt rubber, right? I know several of you out there um, specify asphalt rubber mixes uh, for your pavements. Different types of mixtures. Instead of having the multiple size, coarse, medium, and fine in the Caltrans standard spec book, really there's only one type of mix, the HMA type A. But we also have our RHMA mixes for both open and gap. We do have open graded friction courses as well from an asphalt perspective. And now also when you look at construction, it's not just method, which is really plays a smaller role in the overall um, types of construction activities, but it's all density, it's measured. Going out there, taking a core out of the pavement and understanding what is the actual density of that mix. That was really key because prior to the density, we were finding that method uh, method compaction was, was resulting in pavements that had anywhere from 11 to 13% in place air voids. And you know, for for all of the research and all of our experience, we recognize that we really ideally want to have less than eight percent in place air voids, uh, really to get the performance of our pavements. But probably the most important thing that we've seen differently is the incorporation of other types of materials. 
whether it's recycled asphalt pavement, the wrap, you know, the millings that we get from our from our from our roads that we are removing that have come to their that are severely distressed or come to the end of their life. We're also using different types of additives to improve different characteristics of the mix, like warm mix that helps with um, with really reducing the temperature sensitivity of the mix. We use liquid anti-strips and limes to reduce the moisture sensitivity of the mix. And then we also look for ways that we can include other types of recycled materials like shingles and plastic. I put all of that to you because, you know, I make sure we understand where we're sitting today compared to where we were, you know, nearly 30 years ago. Also pavement sustainability, and this is something all of you have heard time and time again and in, you know, today and in a lot of the conferences and the presentations you've gone to are, you know, we have our com community environment that we're trying to address, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, what does that look like? You know, it's at the plant. It's at the facilities that manufacture the different components of our mixture, whether that's binder, aggregate, or any of the, the, the products that we mentioned a little bit earlier there. Also transportation, moving all of these materials around. How about the construction equipment? How do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions there? And then operations. Operations is probably one of the biggest things that we that we have is how those these this infrastructure and these pavements are utilized and understanding that. So, you know, I, I, I think that's something that we all have to be, be cognizant of is how do we reduce in our communities the greenhouse gas emissions and then also reduce exposure to any harmful, harmful uh, chemicals as well. The other thing we have with sustainability is material availability, right? The material that we have to build our infrastructure, whether it's concrete or asphalt, we know that um, it's getting very difficult to find locally sourced materials. And as we know with, with concrete and asphalt, the primary component over 90 to 95% of that, of that, um, of those mixes are aggregate materials that come out of the ground. And look at that. We find that, you know, the number of sources keep dwindling year after year. The, the amount of permitted reserves keep dwindling year after year. Um, when we look at the entire San Francisco region and you look at the aggregate sources, whether it's coming from Granite Rocks facility in Aromas or the aggregate facilities out in the Pleasanton region or, you know, even the 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 some of the facilities up in the North North Bay we're finding that there's less and less available aggregates that are that are available locally. So sustainability, how can we make sure that how can we help extend the life of these of these reserves by using them for their highest value? How can we utilize other types of materials like recycled materials to help take the place of these aggregate sources? Because what will happen is is that if we don't find a way to do that, we're, we're going to come to a point where we won't have local aggregate sources. We'll have to import more and more aggregates, whether it's coming on a barge from Canada or Mexico or from rail from other parts of Ca California, from other parts of the of the um, of the of the country in the Western US. And what impact will that have in transporting those materials for us to use here in California, for us to use here in the South Bay area? That's something that's going to put more, think of that from greenhouse gases, from emissions and the traffic and the wear and tear on our roads. That will that will that will definitely have a, a significant impact if we don't find a way to sustain our existing materials. And I kind of talked about recycling. You know, how do we reduce materials going to landfills? How do we reduce the the emissions from production and transport? What are some of those things that we're looking at? You know, existing, how do we recycle existing pavement, whether it's going through partial depth or full depth recycling, utilizing more recycled wrap in our asphalt mixes, using ground tire rubber, plastic, shingles, all of that. But the key thing that we need to do when we start to think of sustainability and utilizing these types of materials in our pavements is ensuring that we maintain the overall performance of the roads.
And that's what we need to ensure here. And that's that's sort of what we're looking at. So let's look at mixture performance. What is it that we really are looking for, looking at when we talk about a performing pavement, right? Um, when you think of the roads that you're either um, entrusted to, to take care of and maintain for your communities um, or that you work on and help maintain for our communities, what are two of the, you know, the, the major performance aspects that we look at? Well, obviously the first one is rutting. You know, we need to make sure that we have pavements that are stable, pavements that are going to carry the traffic loads that we need them to carry for that project. And so we need to ensure that that the materials are used, um, take that into account in how we put those materials together. That the maintenance, because I'll tell you, the one thing you'll find out, and I'm sure many of you who've been around a while recognize that the most expensive type of failure in a road to fix is a rut because the only way to fix a rut is to actually take it out. Now, there's another side of this as well for performance that we look at, and that's cracking. That's where the material has, you know, being out there in the environmental climate will shrink and contract with the, with the changing in temperatures, hot and cold cycles. Over time, with the, with the sunshine daily, just, um, blasting that that surface with ultraviolet lights it'll tend to oxidize that that asphalt pavement as well so you know we now have also over time we get fatigue cracking we get cracking that we get that's based off of heavy traffic vehicles and that's where think of it like um your your you know we all love um well when we weren't um when we prior to becoming paperless offices, when we had papers and we'd have paper clips and staples, but you take that paper clip and you'd move it back and forth, back and forth, and you feel it getting warm, and then eventually it would just snap because it would yield because of 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 fatigue. And pavement is the same way; as it moves and flexes over the many many years and the amount of traffic that it comes into, it eventually gets to a point where it starts to wear and it can no longer. It, it, it loses its flexibility. The ultraviolet lights will 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 release some of those um, lighter compounds in the binder that will all of a sudden um, make it more brittle, right? And so those are some of the environmental. You know, as you have that heating, that that heating and cooling and that contracting of the pavement, that will also add um, stresses in there that will cause the pavement to crack early. So when we look at that. Um, we we need to we need to address the rutting performance and we need to ad adjust the cracking performance as well. And so that's where us as engineers come into play. Um, what we need to do is find a way to not just have a pavement that will um, support the loads that are expected on that pavement from whether it's a lot of cars or heavy truck traffic but we also need to make sure that with all that heavy truck traffic or vehicle traffic and with the environmental conditions that it is that is able to also um, address any type of uh, premature cracking and so what we need to do is find that balance between rutting and cracking and why do we say that it's a balance because it's a balancing act because what we do know is in order to increase the stability or the strength of a mix, we all we will we will have to do that at the expense of the durability and the flexibility of that mix. So when we're finding the balance, what we're doing is is we're trying to have enough flexibility in there, enough for for here, in this case, as you see on the bottom on the x-axis, it's it's asphalt content and on the y it's excuse me it's stability what we want to do is we want to have enough asphalt binder in that mix so that it stays really flexible but not so much that it won't be able to support the traffic so we want to find that balance we want a mix that we designed that's that 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 really finds that sweet spot where it can hit that stability and and at the same time address the cracking And if you have any questions, feel free to put up your hand. 
type them in the chat box and we will get to them. Um, we'll be happy to do it right away, <clears throat> right away here. But that's it, trying to find that balance um, and, and that's gonna help us um, with the overall performance of our pavements. So now let's look at how how are we designing our mixes today? And, and as I mentioned, primarily here in California, we look at a volumetric design. And and the one thing that we're, we're the design is really focused on is is really making sure that we have an aggregate structure with binder added to it so that we can get a target air void. And really what we're trying to do with those target air voids in the mix is, is that is sort of the the when we have our compacted specimen, which you know we talked about in construction at 8%. So this is something further down in the life of the pavement where it's going to consolidate eventually and get to get to 4% air voids. So we want to design and look at that, um, what that what that mid to later part of the pavement life looks like. And so the one thing that we are really good at is measuring the mass of things. Why are we good at that? We have scales, right? You can go ahead and take rock, put it on a scale, and you know what the mass is. You can take asphalt binder, you can pour it into a into a nice little jar there, and you can put it on a scale and you can measure the weight. All right. So that's great. But the problem is, is we can't measure the weight of air. So when we start to look at at materials here, we recognize that um, we have to find another way to determine and measure how much air is in there. And so what we do is, and this is why we call super paved volumetric design, is we look at the volume of materials, right? So we have to find ways to take the weights that we know of of these materials, translate into a, them into a volume. And once we know the volume, ah, then we can actually quantify what the what the air the volume of air the percent of air in that in that mixture is and so we'll do that really through straightforward uh calculations and measurements is we will go ahead and measure the weights of the materials we will actually measure them in water to help us do a correlation and determine the specific gravity of the materials once we have a specific gravity, which is really that mass and that and that volume that uh, for that that unit mass and and unit volume and volume that it takes up that that unit mass takes up, we can then say, all right, for all of this aggregate, the aggregate that we have, we can measure that. Here's our specific gravity that will give us our volume for the amount of mass that we have. So now that we have all of our volumes, we start filling in the left side of 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 the uh of this of the chart here and then eventually we'll be able to calculate out what our air voids are for the mix it's really the concept especially for those of you who remember in your civil engineering going back to your geotech classes this is this is classic stuff and i think you even end up seeing it on the either the eit or the pe exam there's always something like that on on there but that's really the concept and remember this super paved design came out of the 90s right and so that's something that's another thing to think about. But what is the overall process procedure, right? So what we do is um, super paved, superior performing asphalt pavements. Here in California, we reference Asphalt Institute MS2. That that uh, mixed design manual has the procedure set out in great detail on how do we go about determining what mixture we should use using super paved. And really, it's a straightforward procedure. And I think you even see this um, very similar to what we've seen in the Veeam mix design. For those of you who recall Veeam, or maybe some of you, some of your agencies are still using Veeam. Um, and really, what it is is we're going to select the materials, we're going to select the aggregates, we're going to select the binder, and we're going to select the additives that we're going to use in this mixture. Now, when we look at the binder. Typically, the binder grading, when I mentioned PG grading, is going to be specific to your region. And 
we and the nice thing is as engineers we don't have to go and figure all that out ourselves because it's already been set forth in the caltrans highway design manual in regards to which binders we should use for our locations and and typically we find in the bay area you'll typically be using a 64 minus 16 or a six yeah typically a 64 minus 16 you may see a 64 minus 10 for for your binder your aggregates you're going to select the aggregates based off of very uh, specific aggregate properties like crush count. You'll see um, flat and elongated. You'll see angularity, aggregate angularity, um, which is crush count, but it's really about um, the shape of the aggregates that you're, you'll be looking at. And then any other additives that you might you might incorporate into the mix. So then what you'll do is you'll take the aggregate and we'll go ahead and um, uh, look at that aggregate and really put it together, blend it together uh, so that we can, um, keeping in mind that um, we have a target range for the grading band. So that target range is set in our specifications for our design that, you know, we want to have it within uh, plus or minus of a target within uh, for both different size uh, sieves within the grading within the um, aggregates. So we'll have some more coarse aggregate, maybe a three quarter or a half inch. You'll have a number four. You'll have a number two hundred, which is all your dust and fines. So we'll have all of that to help us put together an aggregate structure. But it's not just putting in the grading band. You know, just trying to set it right down the middle. That's ideally where we want to go. But we also have to look at the plant operations. We have to consider plant operations. What aggregates do they have available? What are the sizings of those aggregates uh, stockpiles that they're using? And then how do they proportion the mix the, the mix such that they can um, they can maximize and optimize the use of those stockpiled materials? Um, so that also gets into uh, plays a role in the design of the aggregate structure. So now once that's done, it's all about trying to figure out how much binder are you going to put into that aggregate structure. So from there, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and take that aggregate. We'll add some binder at different binder contents, right? So we'll have a, a sample at, at, you know, let's say 4%, 4.5%, 5%, 5.5%, 6%. And, and you will, we'll, we'll batch all of those up. And then we'll go ahead and um, compact those specimens in, in our gyratory compactor. So when we're doing that, what we're really doing is trying to figure out how does that material compact under under load. And the gyratory compactor is very similar to the Veeam compactor in the sense that it's really it's a way for it to simulate how it's being compacted in the field in the field under a um, you know where we compact in the field with rollers. Here, trying to do a very similar type of compaction effort. Now we have these these um, specimens, compacted specimens, where we can now check for air voids. We can get mixed specific gravity, because if you remember in our in our in our previous slide, you know, we're going to need our total, you know, our total mass, compacted mass, and then we're also going to find the specific gravity, right? We're going to we're going to um, of both asphalt and aggregate so that we can over here understand what our unit volume is. We do all of that. Um, and then uh, we figure out what is the ideal binder content that gets us to our design air voids. And typically for us, it's all 4% air voids. And then finally, we take that mix. We have that mix. We're good to go. Let's rut test it, right? Let's test the, the, the strength of that mix. If you're using Veeam, maybe it's a stability test. So that's what we do right now. Now, up here is a list of some of those performance characteristics performance, and, I, and I, I say I put quotations around that because if you look at those, um, you know, what we're looking at is individual characteristics that if we meet these criteria, we should be able to keep it from rutting. The mix shouldn't rut or the mix shouldn't crack because of the binder. Now, some of this has been validated through field and test track projects across the country. And then, you know, this applies to both super pave and veeam regardless of what you're using but but remember we're looking at individual characteristics of the individual components to give us an idea of whether the mix sample is going to rut or not or whether it's going to crack 
So what are the challenges is where's the mix test? We don't we're not using a test to actually evaluate the the quality of the mix and the performance of the mix. We started to look at that because obviously we in especially in California, traffic loading is the biggest is the biggest failure mode for rutting. And so we've developed, you know, Francis Veen developed the st stapleometer to help uh, assess that. But primarily in California, because of the challenges with with um, running a, st a stapleometer, we've moved more towards the Hamburg wheel wheel rut test. But we don't. So maybe we have a handle on rutting, but do we have a handle on cracking? We don't have a test. All we're doing is say, is the binder selected appropriate and do we have enough and, and how much binder do we have in there? That's the only way we're going to know if we're going to have something that's going to crack or not. The other thing is, is that when we start to add other materials like recycled materials, like anti-strips, um, other rejuvenators or other types of performance materials, the volumetric pr properties do not really tell us what the effect of those materials are going to have on the overall mix performance. We have to remember that when these mi when these mixes were evaluated, um, they were really back in. Let's go back to ninety five. It was very simple. Mixes were very simple then. They were pretty much asphalt binder unmodified with aggregates. So when we think of all of the validation that's been happening on it for the development of both Veeam and SuperPay, that's what they used was um, pretty basic materials and feel that yes, when we have asphalt and aggregate and we do these SuperPay volumetric designs, yes, we will have a performing mix because we see it here in the in the the way we design the mix, it matches what we're doing in the field, and the field is telling us that it's 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 performing. The other part that we have to also um, be concerned about with volumetrics is there are some key bulk specific gravity properties that we are not able to um, uh, to have a lot of reliability on. So that can also affect whether we have enough binder or not enough binder. So some of the things we have to work around with SuperPave and we have to understand. So when we think about innovations in our pavements, you know, how do we utilize more cost effective materials, right? This is what when we talk about innovation, we talk about how do we make more sustainable projects? We need to have a better way to assess um, the utilization of of materials, the utilization of wrap, shingles, plastics, whatever it is, we have to be able to properly assess the effectiveness of performance additives like warm mix asphalt, like liquid anti strips, rejuvenators, even modified binders, whether it's with asphalt rubber or if or if it's with um, SBS polymers. So that's where balanced mix design comes into play. That's why we're looking at balanced mix design. We're trying to develop mixtures that are that have the performance we need and are sustainable at the same time. So I put this back up because remember when we talked about this and we looked at um, stability, um, you know, the structure of the of the mix, the rutting resistance of the mix, and but we looked at it in terms of asphalt binder percentage. Because remember, we don't have a crack test in these. So we 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 say, all right, we know that high binder, we're going to be better durable durability wise, low binder will be better stability wise. So let's think about the testing. So I mentioned before that we use the Hamburg wheel rut test, and this is kind of what it looks like if you haven't seen it um, in the lab um, before. But essentially what we have is in this case, two compacted specimens that we we trim, we put them together, and then we put a steel wheel over it, and it just runs back and forth and back and forth. Um, and, and when we're talking about back and forth, we're talking about something like 20,000 passes, right? 20,000, 25,000 passes is typically how, how long the test is run. We're using a six inch gyratory compacted specimen to 7% air voids. The other thing you'll notice here in that middle picture picture is that the um, the specimens are submerged in water, and it's not just it's not just 
essentially set in a water bath, but we also have a temperature of that water bath is is kind of elevated. And the elevated temperature is, is essentially based on the binder grade that we're using in the mix. So as it goes back and forth, back and forth, as you can see on the right, we'll be able to assess the redding potential for that mix. And what does that look like graphically? So that's what you're looking at here. That red line is, is sort of what the test output is for a Hamburg. And as you see that little slope that comes down and it talks about stripping inflection point, and this is the point at which we start to see whether we have a moisture sensitivity issue. If we see this drop off, we know we have a moisture sensitivity uh, risk with that mix. And then that's where now we can utilize different types of treatments, whether it's a liquid anion strip or lime or, or an organosilane, something else that we can help to treat the aggregate, treat the binder, treat the mix really um, to, to minimize that change in slope. And then also you, it's, it's an overall redding slope. So what we're looking for is 12 and a half millimeters, um, which is 12 and a half millimeters in uh, about 15,000 passes. So that's kind of something for you to think about is it here is we're looking at, we're not, we're not going to be focused. We don't necessarily need to be focused on the aggregate um, the, the binder high temperature grade. The, don't get me wrong, those are important, but we're, we're, we're not assuming that by having the, a good high temperature grade and an aggregate um, uh, angularity that we're going to get good non rutting pavements. Um, we're actually going to look at how all of the materials within that mix react together um, and, and evaluate its rutting potential on that. Also cracking resistant. Now we have tests available to us that are fairly um, straightforward to run in a, in a lab. They don't take a whole lot of equipment. As you can see here, it's essentially an indirect tensile strength test, um, just a different loading head and, and a different, um, some, some, some different uh, uh, test equipment that we'll use um, really to evaluate how the material does in cracking. Now, what does that look like? This is sort of the curve that we're getting for an output. And what this is really doing is, is we're, we're using another six inch gyratory specimen. What we're doing here is we're seeing as we start to squish, and that's really what we're doing is we're squishing this, uh, this disc that's on its side. It's gonna hold, it's gonna hold its strength, and then it's gonna get to a, to a, um, to a point at which all of a sudden it's going to, um, release right it's going to yield and then once we get to that point now we're going to look at the back side of the curve and that's going to give us our value right our mixture cracking value because what we want to do is um this yielding part if the more vertical it is the more prone it is to cracking the flatter it is the more uh the more resistance to cracking we're going to see in this mix right and so that's what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the way this mix deforms um, and, and deforms under a under a loading. And that's going to give us our cracking potential for the mix. So let's take that original curve that where we had um, running, you know, stability versus asphalt content. And now let's take these two tests and let's look at that from balanced mix design. And so now what we're looking at is rutting resistance as given to us in the test in the in the testing of the Hamburg wheel rut test and the cracking re resistance, which is which are values we're getting from ideal CT. So when we look at these, now we start to look at as we move from left to right and we start to to move across the um, diagonally, let's say 45 degrees. Now we're starting to find that balance between the two. And so then what we start to look at is how can we use this for the types of roads that we are going to um, we are going to build now. Um, for example. Let's say we we have a road that's rural, low volume. Um, think about let's say a county road where it sees a truck and a cow a day. Uh, what's the major primary failure mode? It's going to be cracking. So in this case, maybe we're OK with giving up a little rutting resistance because we're not going to see much traffic on it. And 
we really want to design it for cracking, right? For cracking. So we, we're we we're not worried about writing, we're worried about cracking. So now what we'll do is we'll look for values of the cracking test, which are a little bit higher. Um, so we'll, we'll design for a rut resistance and a crack resistance, let's say in these blue squares. Now let's look at the other angle. So remember, rutting's going up. So we're okay with, with this sort of minor rutting because we really want this cracking resistance. But let's go the other route. Let's say we now have a pavement that has a lot of traffic, an arterial, um, and that's the primary thing we want to we want to design for. Um, so maybe we're willing to to you know we we have some cracking resistance as well, but we're able to give up a little bit on that because we want a much more higher rut. So now we can set our values of a cracking resistance a little bit lower and increase the rutting resistance and. And that's sort of where we will design our, our mixes into, right? So this is that using our minimum values of our test results to really fine tune our, our, um, our mixes in the field for the actual environmental and traffic loading that they're, that they're going to see. So when we do that with, what does that balanced mix design procedure look like? There's really four ways that we we are evaluating um, four main approaches. The first approach is where, you know what, we're just going to do our typical volumetric design and then whatever spits out, we're going to do mix testing on it. And if it passes, great, move on, right? If it doesn't pass, then you need to redesign the, the, the mixes, um, the volumetric, use the volumetrics within the, the specified range to try to get it to work. Um, the problem is, is that now we've shrunk down a little bit of the flexibility for the designer in making it meet, and we probably will end up restricting some of these, um, some of the mixes. And we don't fully, and remember, we're still limiting ourselves to the limitations of volumetric design. Another way that we can do it is, um, we could now take volumetric design with performance op optimization. And here we start with the current volumetric design, but we're going to evaluate mixture performance at interval binder binder contents, including the optimal binder binder content. Um, and then we'll select the binder content, which satisfy, satisfies the performance criteria. May not satisfy the um, the air the air void, right? But it but it'll satisfy the performance. Another approach is performance modified volumetric, and here we begin with a volumetric design, but then we're going to modify the design based on performance testing results. And in this case here, what we're going to what we're going to look at is um, where we will be open to the idea of changing our volumetric requirements based off of the performance test. So let's say we go in where where we have a VMA of 14 and we have a an air void of 4% and our number of gyrations is 85. But when we go over to the to the performance characteristics that we're really looking for, the cracking test and the rut rit test, in order to get there, we need to be at three and a half percent with a 65 gyratory mix and our VMAs, oh, we can keep it at 14. Um, then what we would do is we would reset those volumetric requirements for that project to based off of what the design parameters show. And then the last one is performance design is really where we 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 the the mix designer we just give them full you just do whatever you need to do to create a mix that will meet those performance. You're not guided by a specific mix design methodology like SuperPave. Maybe you can use Veeam, maybe you can use Marshall, or maybe you can just use regular uh, your regular experience. And you look at different ways to put the mix together to meet that performance criteria. I think when we get to the performance design aspect, I think we're still a ways away from that because we have to do a lot more refining on the performance test. But I think that's the direction we want to go because in the end, that's where we'll be able to be optimize the mix. We'll be able to optimize it for uh, cost effectiveness, for the materials that are available in our area, as well as um, uh, being able to um, 
create a more sustainable mix with the performance characteristics that we're truly really looking for. But right now, I think that performance modified volumetric design is is it seems to be the direction that that most agencies today are starting to 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 move towards. So when we look at performance modified volumetric design, um, these properties, you know, they may not meet the criteria that we currently utilize for super pay volumetric QA, um, but what they do is they will allow us to, um, uh, you know, we'll utilize the super pave to, to develop that in initial mixture. We'll conduct our, our red and crack testing, and then we'll adjust it according to the performance criteria and then um, those specific properties and will will then become the acceptance criteria for the actual project. I think the one thing we need to do, all of us need to do when we start to move down this path is we need to rethink our specifications and understand why do we specify the use of certain materials or restrict the use of materials? I know there are a lot of agencies out there who say, well, we don't want to put any more wrap into our material because it's going to lead to premature cracking. Or we want to we want to ensure that we have um, uh, very high crush count materials, and that's all well and good. Um, but what we're trying to do is, in a past, those those limitations came out because we didn't have a way to test for it to test the mix from a performance perspective. And so now, what we have to look at is. Now that we're incorporating writing tests, now that we're important incorporating cracking tests, you know, that allows us to understand what the risk of 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 having these materials or what the benefits, right? Understanding what the benefits of these materials are to the mix. How do we how do we utilize that to our to our benefit and to the benefit of the of and the efficiency and the sustainability of our roads? So we need to rethink why we why we um, restrict things if we do all if we do truly have performance tests to really tell us whether it is a risk or whether it is a problem. So obviously I mentioned earlier we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Rutting test obviously is is currently in use and widely available in California when we look at that Hamburg wheel rut test, ASHTO T324, CT389. We're actually looking for something that's a little bit faster, but that's not nearly as fast tracked as some of the other efforts we're doing. But the other thing is a cracking test, and this is that ideal CT. So Caltrans has done their initial evaluation on ideal CT as part of their long life pavement project projects, and that's a whole nother discussion for another time. Um, but we're now beginning that effort on a start to start a larger statewide evaluation. Now, based off of the initial date timeline for that, it looks like we're still a ways away for for really the the full adoption of balanced mix design with Caltrans 2030. But I think I think we can actually get that done a lot sooner. City of San Jose, which is really right in our in our in our backyards here. In the Bay Area, City of San Jose is already doing some benchmarking this year with the intent of having a specification developed by by um, next year for use in the city for on city projects. And industry is constantly utilizing these tests to to evaluate their their mixes and understand how they how they affect their operations. And what does that evaluation look like? Benchmarking. Um, looking at all the mix, all the mixes in a region and seeing how they all test out performance calibration, seeing how those values relate to actual in 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 service pavement performance training, making sure everyone understands how the test works, how the design works, and then also and then finally the specification development, assuring we have a really good specification that's that's ready to go out and be used on a regular basis. So just for for all of you to think about, you know, we're 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 right around the corner for balanced mix design. And when you look at the way balanced mix design is rolling out around the country, California is actually on the front end of that wave, um, and so that's a good thing. Um, as we start to see the more the increased demand for the use of recycled materials like wrap shingles, plastics, um, when balanced mix design will allow us to utilize performance mix tests to assess um, the application of them of these mix recycled materials in our in our everyday pavements 
um, as our aggregate qualities reduce. Um, we have to think about um, maybe aggregate qualities from diminishing sources. How can we maximize their use? Maybe there's other materials that may not be as high grade or as as we ideally like to use. But you know what? We are now able to go ahead and um, and um, use uh, other types quality materials because we have other ways to mitigate them and to ensure we still have a performing pavement. And then finally, we want to identify an ide um, ideal proportions of all of our materials to maximize their benefits. So a couple resources for all of you, a few resources for all of you to, to consider when we're talking about balanced mix design. There's the National Asphalt Pavement Association resource guide there. There is an FHWA implementation tech brief. So that sort of gives an outline on uh, for agencies on, on what implementation steps you are taken um, to go through this process, which Caltrans is already heading down. And then finally, balanced mix design resources from the National Center of Asphalt Technology in Auburn, um, War Eagle, obviously, if you know about them. Um, but there, there is a really good way to see um, implementation suggestions, as well as all of the latest research related to balanced mix design, the various test methods that are used. Um, so with that, I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to um, address them at this time. Wow, just, Keith? just an absolute mountain of information. Brandy, thank you. Brandon, thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I do have a quick question, and I may have missed it. What, um, you talked about the amount of time that the rut testing or rut test takes. Yeah. What's the duration of the, what's that time period for a, a rut test? Well, I think it depends on really uh, sampling. You know, obviously, when you look at the over time to get a result is when you sample from the field all the way through um, to the end of the result, but you're still looking at something that's gonna take quite a few hours just to run through the iterations, the 20,000 passes, it's going back and forth. Right, right. Like my finger's going this, now do it 20,000 times. Yeah, it, 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 it takes a good number of hours to run. Um, when we're talking about an ideal CT test, um, really it doesn't, it, it's about once you have the, when you look at with the with the Hamburg, the production and the and the compaction of the specific specimen in the compactor are all the same, right? Maybe, maybe an, an an hour, couple hours, especially when you're looking at getting the 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 sample up to the right temperature. But that that ideal CT is a fairly quick test. I, I you know in in it, for practical purposes, you're turning around a test result for an ideal CT in about a day. Figure two to three days for a Hamburg wheel rut test. And so there is another version of a rutting test that is more in line with ideal CT, where maybe it's a, a one day turnaround. We're still a ways off from that, but but that's just something to think about is there there is a there is time related to any of these types of mixed performance tests. Um, other questions out there, folks, either raise your hand and or uh, or put something in chat. Be happy to get to it. I've got a random question for you, Brandon. This one. Yeah. Just my random neuron firing here. Were you surprised by, we just got done with all of this massive storm damage. Was there yeah. any surprise or um, not surprise uh, for you as, as a pavement expert um, in, in what's going on out there? Um, the one thing that I keep hearing everyone uh, hearing, obviously you see it in the news, obviously you, when you drive around, it's the, the amount of um, cracking distress. And is it a surprise? No, because especially when you have old age oxidized pavements that now have uh, saturated soils underneath, they're gonna flex more. And as they flex more, as it's aged and oxidized, it's gonna crack more. So I think what, I think if anything, and, I, and we saw this in 2018 as well, if anything, what we're seeing out there with our cracked pavements, and this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, is the result of the decades of neglected maintenance on our pavements. Yeah. Right. And it's both asphalt and concrete across the board um, that that is showing. Now I, I I like to think that what we have with SB1 and and reinvigorating the the transportation funds, and that's a whole nother 
another discussion, but yes. <laughs> that that's actually going to help put us better in the right track to address these. And it's interesting because right before I came on here, I was in a in a Caltrans meeting and one of the things that they're with all the emergency work is they're saying, hey, what's what do we have for some of the new technologies, new materials that we can use to patch all of these potholes and keep these roads from falling apart until we can actually get to the real fix that they need. And so that's that's something that that we're going to help them out with. But that is it's not a surprise. It's unfortunate, but I think we can. Um, yeah. 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 And, and just that statement, um, that last statement, you know, how can we put a Band-Aid on it until we can fix, you know, fix it for real? Yeah. Um, it is just a it, um, uh, it says a thousand words right there. All right. Any last questions, anybody? Um, I don't see anything else in chat. Thank you, Brandon. This was just awesome. Thank you, everybody, for uh, presentations.